Well, um, this is amazing. This is the biggest crowd I've ever spoken to. This is really pretty cool. Um, I want to just say one, one thing here that's impressed me so far about what we've been watching. And, and it's a psychological term that I learned that really describes you folks. Uh, it's euphoric recall. It's our ability when we go through these experiences that aren't that pleasant, really, you know, for the most part. <laughs> when we think about it later on, it changes. And we experience all the good parts of it. Euphoric recall. So I think it's a good thing. It's why all you people are here and all those many thousands of people in Maine that have canoes in the yards that never use them, never use them. They don't have euphoric recall. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> mental and physical um, techniques to allow us to keep doing what we're doing as we're aging. Oh, here we go. OK, this is me at five years old. I'm Davy Crockett. I starred in my local tap dancing school production of Davy Crockett. And my mom sent me this a few years ago. I forgot all about it. But it kind of describes what I like to do now, which is kind of think that I'm a mountain guy, you know, walk in the wilderness, look at the, look at the scenery, have some buddies around that kind of can give me some encouragement. And um, it, it's kind of cool. So um, I wasn't really great at anything as far as sports when I was a kid. I was a scrub on the Little League team. I weighed about 240 in high school. I was a little too heavy to, to jump and play basketball. I was scared to climb high places, but I was very comfortable in the outdoors. And I think that's been responsible for some of my successes. So um, I retired as soon as I could. I had 25 years into the Maine State retirement system, and then I was 52 years old. So what to do? I kind of languished from 52 to 57, and when I decided to hike the Appalachian Trail. So from the ages of 57 to 63, this was my experiences. I threw hike the AT in 2007, and then way on the left is the Pacific Crest Trail. That was three years later when I was 60. I did that in five months. And then the uh, middle line is the Continental Divide Trail, which I did four years ago. And um, <clears throat> I was awarded the Triple Crown of hiking for that. And I was the 230th person in the world to do that. So um, it's a small club. Since that time, I've really been obsessed with exploring the abilities, the um, attitudes, and the skills that allowed me to do what I was doing. And really, I'm hoping to continue to do it. So it's, I'm writing a book, a second book, um, on endurance and aging. And I'm going to be presenting some highlights of the book here. And I'd love to continue the conversation on any of these things that interest you a little bit later on when we have the break, if anybody cares. So it's been said that. Uh, through hiking, which is what we call this, when we try and do these trails in one continuous five or six month experience, is 90% mental and 10% physical. I've seen physically strong hikers due to quit due to beliefs that just floor me. Like, it's boring to walk outside in wilderness all day. I, I just am stunned at that. I've also seen, like, people that believe that they don't have to prepare, and by just walking out in the, in the course of a few weeks or months, they can get fit enough to finish, and that doesn't work either. So I think that there are things that we can do to bolster both the physical and the mental aspects of this. <clears throat> so there's a term called keystone experience. A keystone experience is an experience that when you choose to, to do it, it is so powerful in your life that it somehow allows you to basically be free of many thousands of other um, lesser important experiences. And <clears throat> I was fortunate enough 
in the early 1970s to learn transcendental meditation. It's a meditation technique that was popularized by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. The Beatles all did it. Um, it was very popular back then. I'm one of the few people that continued to practice it for 50 years. And um, I'm right now meditating approximately an hour and a half a day. I think that that's been the bedrock of my ability to kind of modulate anxiety. Um, if anybody's read Tim Ferriss or listened to him, he's a very popular best-selling author who um, has a book called Tools of Titans, where he identifies about 100 world-class professionals that are the absolute tops in their field. And 80% of those folks have some kind of meditation practice. So I think that that's one of the bedrocks of what, what we might want to experience if we're wanting some means of eliminating stressors, anxiety, and tension from our life. So I believe that that's a thing that I will continue doing. Another thing is um, <clears throat> this, stoicism. I I've stumbled onto this stoicism thing. How I'm seeing it in the press now. Are people seeing, um, like I am, references to stoicism? There's a guy from Canada, Donald Robertson. He's wrote a best-selling book called How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. And, and he's, a, he's a psychologist that basically has recycled stoicism in his, in his practice to talk about some of the things that it can benefit us in the modern world. This is me uh, when I was not experiencing euphoric recall. <laughs> this is what I looked like toward the end of one of my hikes. I was basically almost dead. I lost 33 pounds in the Appalachian Trail. Everything that I owned was ripped, broken, had to be replaced. And it really got me thinking about what does it mean to have a positive attitude? It's very easy to have a positive attitude when things are going well, right? However, the real test is keeping a positive attitude when things don't go well. Having a positive attitude does not mean that you have to like what you're going through, but it has to mean that you can cope with it in a reasonable manner. Let me talk about three, three stoic techniques that are actually not that old. They're old, but now they're new again. They're, they're under a new category called cognitive behavioral therapy. So, negative visualization. Ne negative visualization, uh, this is a practice that was started by the Greeks in the third century. Um, so what we do when we do negative visualization is we imagine we've lost things that we value. For example, um, a wife leaves you, um, your car is stolen, you're fired. By imagining those things and just spending some time actually feeling like how bad that'd be that would happen, it's a way of having the regular world look a little better. Hey, wait a minute. These things aren't going on. How, how bad can things be? They could be a lot worse. Um, the second is perception of control. It's very important for us to understand what kinds of things we can control out there when we're on these trips and what kinds we can. We can't control the weather. You know, we heard about that already with many people, you know, who just got foiled in terms of their original plans. Um, we have some control over whether we win a tennis game, for example. Um, one of the things we have complete control over is our goals. So it's important to determine which do I want to kind of like back off and which do I want to put a little more effort into. So the third thing, <laughs> and this is my specialty area, is um, besides thinking about discomfort, experience it on a regular basis, even in a contrived way. Some examples of this that I practice are underdressing for the cold. Um, I don't do it, but I got a buddy that's a main guy, my, my buddy Frank, he has a practice where every morning, even now, he goes out and he walks barefoot in the cold for about five minutes. 
Um, tolerate thirst. Tolerate hunger. Um, by us doing this and practicing it, and it still is in us the belief that we're hardened to, you know, misfortune a little bit, um, and instill some confidence in us, and it decreases anxiety when these things really do come. A fancy name for this, in psychological terms, is premeditation of adversity. <clears throat> I get a lot of people asking me, hey, I really want to get into this long-distance hiking thing or long-distance canoeing or long-distance, you know, snow walking or whatever. Can you recommend a good book for me? I, I recommend this book all the time. This is the book. I used to have a misguided belief that my will would push me through anything. And I think many of us have relied on that particularly when we were younger, and it worked. It doesn't work now. <laughs> On my 50th birthday, I had this crazy idea to bench press 350 pounds. I did it, but I'm paying the price now. My right hand is scheduled for carpal tunnel surgery on March 6th. It will be my 10th surgery. I've experienced surgery in Two surgeries on this shoulder, one surgery on this shoulder, surgery on both of my uh, knees from cartilage, and four hernias. And it's all through overuse, and it's through the exact opposite of what I now believe is what we need to be doing to be more successful as we move through life, particularly in the outdoors. Study this cartoon. How many people have experienced something like this? You know, you're making your plans, and then reality hits. So, I'd like to list for you some of the uh, adversity that I had to uh, think about on a typical 2,000-mile hike. I'm not going to read you the whole list. I'll probably read you like 50 items off it. There's heat, cold, rain, snow, humidity, ants, flies, Gnats, mosquitoes, wildfires, bears. How about scorpions? How about a surplus of poisonous snakes? And if that isn't enough, we got deer flies, we got horse flies, we got black flies, we got yellow jackets, hornets, and now we got Giardia, we got Cryptosporidia, we got Montezuma's Revenge. How about Lyme disease? This is a big deal in Maine, Lyme disease now. I'm gonna stop. Any one of these misfortunes that happen to us while we're out having an experience in the wilderness is usually surmountable. The problem comes when you get multiple hardships occurring at the same time for weeks on end. They slowly chip away until you break. Okay. So... <clears throat> This is from the book, Improvisation. And I'm hearing it everywhere here in this audience. Uh, this is a yes crowd. This isn't a yeah but organization. You guys are, are, are excellent at, at agreeing with one another and extending the conversations by, by things like yes and. Um, and how many times have we had incredible experiences by just being willing to, to say yes to someone that offers us a chance to go on one of these experiences or these trips, or even to be here in this audience by saying yes. We have no idea where it might lead us in terms of a conversation we might have or, or a page in a book that might inspire us to go and say yes in a way that leads us to more enriching experiences. <clears throat> when you say yes, it means you can do it. And when you say yes, it opens the door for others to start to exert control and to become involved in whatever it is that, you know, we're carrying on. Another, another big maxim from uh, the improvisation book is to just show up. This is a picture of me on the Continental Divide Trail with a guy that I met from Maine. I had no idea I'd meet a guy from Maine. He ended up uh, finishing the trail, you know, some five months later, just shortly after I did. 
And we both said yes somehow, and we showed up, and we ended up having a great friendship. In this day of smartphones, people are not showing up. They think they are by speaking to someone else or by yesing or by liking, but you're not going anywhere. You're not showing up. You're missing out. Um, I belong to a group of mountain bikers that I've been riding with for about 33 years. We ride year-round. Every Sunday, it's at 9.30. Most Tuesdays and most Thursdays, it's around 5 o'clock. The ritual allows us of this kind of thing. And we talked about rituals so that we don't have to worry. If we just show up at that ride, I know it's going to be great. And my ritual actually starts the night before. I want to ensure that I show up because now what I do is I check the tire pressure front and rear of my bike. I check the shock pressures. I lube my chain. I put my bike in my vehicle. I get all my gear ready to go and I put it right next to the door so I know when I wake up in the morning, I'm increasing my chances of showing up. <clears throat> Physical interventions. I'm going to hit a few. I, I, any one of these, we could go on for like more than 25 minutes, but I'm just going to kind of mention some of the ones that I think are really worth us thinking about to put some time into. Uh, uh, and this is the first one. I, I used to weigh about 240. Uh, before all my hikes, I was about 215, and I always lost a whole bunch of weight, and then I went back to 215. And after I got off the trail in 2000. Uh, 13, I wanted to keep my weight down. I've been able to keep it at about 200, and it's making a huge difference in, in, in how I feel. Um, so I think that that's an important thing to kind of try and keep in check. A common misconception is that we lose the ability to move as we age. So it was formally thought that after the age of 40, and I'm not a, I'm not a medical doctor, but I think that um, some of this stuff is fairly, fairly solid, and I've done some pretty good research. It was thought that after age 40, your muscles atrophy approximately 8% a decade, and then it significantly decreases after age 75. Well, that research is now being questioned, uh, and uh, out of the University of Pittsburgh, they looked at recently a study of 40 competitive senior athletes, ages 40 through 81. As long as you continue to keep moving and exercising, the thigh mass of those people in their 60s was equivalent to uh, thigh mass of people in their 40s. And, and, the, and the thing was that 60-somethings were as strong as 40-somethings, and I believe that's true with many of the folks that I'm around. I find I'm just as strong right now that I was, and I'm a, little, I'm a little smarter in how I use my body, too. So there's some hope there. However, we've got to be careful. Does anybody remember Jim Fix? Yeah, we all remember Jim Fix. He exemplified mind over matter. Before he took up running, he was obese, he was sedentary, he drank, he smoked, and he had a high genetic risk for cardiovascular disease. He was known for running 10 miles a day, every day, rain or shine. In June 1984, uh, Jim Fix dropped dead after a run. And autopsy revealed that in the eight weeks before he died, he had actually suffered three heart attacks. What's the lesson here? Listen to your body? Yeah. The lesson is, and this is where I'm going to go next, you need to know how much exercise is good and how much might be harmful to you. So we'll spend a little time talking about this. Study that picture. That was us. That's kind of still us. All right? So our genetic predisposition is to... Ha our bodies are designed to walk this much a day. We're not doing it, you know? Um, as hunter-gatherers, we were essentially... Um, professional athletes who basically were physically active all day long. There are tribes now that, that are still like this uh, in Africa. Uh, the Hazma, they, their baseline average is approximately nine miles a day. They dig roots, they climb trees. In contrast, um, the typical American male or female, um, they, we weigh 50% more than them. We work 75% less. 
and we burn only 750 calories a day on physical activity, explaining why we gain weight so easily. So the average, um, uh, at least this is America, and you guys kind of look like us uh, up here, you know? I mean, in terms of what your world looks like to me, it's just a lot bigger than mine, but it's the same stuff. So a typical American day, three-tenths of a mile they walk. They commute an average of 32 miles a day in a car, and they eat one-third of their meals outside the house. Add things like food processors, dishwashers, clothes washers, dryers. It's continually being reduced, our need to do physical activity, so we're really in trouble. So how do you know if you're doing too much activity? This is one way that you can gauge this. These are, this is called heart rate variability. And uh, we can do it now with a smartphone, a chest or a finger, a, a chest measurement device or a finger device. Um, heart rate variability is measuring the intervals between the beats of your heart. It's not the same as uh, a pulse. It's a form of biofeedback, and it, and it actually is used psychologically to treat anxiety. So um, I do this. I've been doing this for several years. Um, the screen looks something like this. It takes two or three minutes in the morning. Um, you just hit the button, the, the, the arrows keep going. That's a good reading. That's my pulse on top, and that's my heart rate variability on the bottom. Why do I do this? I do this because this is how I gauge my activity recovery. Um, and this is how many professional athletes now and trainers are gauging whether they tell someone, go all out today and really go for it, or you need a rest day. We can measure that through the variability. And it's, a, and it's a good metric, and it's very solid. That's, that's three years of my kind of aggregated data. And, and you can also trace trends in your yearly energy levels. And it also is highly responsive to um, if you're getting sick. You can pick up uh, through the variability, like if you're getting the flu or the cold. Um, it, it's a way of kind of triggering you to, to watch it. Something's changed here. You need to be a little more careful. So you, you could look into this. The other thing I want to talk about is how fast and how long we should. I, I think walking is the exercise that we can all do most easily. Um, and it's involved in paddling as well through, you know, these uh, portages. Correct? Correct? Yeah. All right. So, um, you want to walk a lot, and you want to walk fast. Let's talk about walking speed first. Slow walkers are at a higher rate for heart-related disease compared to the general population. There was a study done by the UK Biobank involving almost a half a million people, 474,000, and it showed that slow walkers were twice as likely to have a heart-related death as fast walkers, even after they factored in things like smoking, waist circumference, and body mass index. The people that were particularly at risk for earlier death were underweight individuals with a slow walking pace. So take, the takeaway here is that fitness is the most important thing, not your weight, not weight loss, not smoking. It's our ability to keep moving at a fairly good pace. We can do that. If you can't do that, it, you can work up to that. <clears throat> the other thing I want to talk about in my few minutes left here is genetic testing. <clears throat> I, uh, about four years ago, I had my DNA tested by this company out of Great Britain. It cost about $200. You, split in a, you spit in a tube, you send it off to the UK, and then what comes back is um, uh, DNA analysis of approximately 40 different genes that are related to health, fitness, nutrition, and then it combines the findings and suggests lifestyle changes that might assist you individually, particularly for this. Um, I'd like to show you one example of um, how this played out for me. Um, there is a gene, we, we, we heard the song about coffee, I love that. And I, I love coffee, and, and thank God I do well with coffee. But a lot of people don't do well with coffee, it's true. 
And why do people not do well with coffee? I learned why when I got my genetic test. I have the double allele, double A gene over on the right there. That means I'm a fast coffee processor. I can drink it. I feel a lift after approximately 15, 20 minutes. It's flushed out of my system in about three or four hours. If you're a slow metabolizer, you drink coffee and it's in your system for 16 to 20 hours and you're not doing well with it. It's hard for you to keep it out of there and you get jangly and that's why people can't do it. So there are many things that I learned from this genetic assessment that I did to change some of my lifestyle things. The other thing I found really interesting with this um, was it allows you to understand whether you're the type of personality that would do better with speed kind of activities, like a racer or a bike racer or a runner, whether you're a person that's that can do power, and this would be weightlifting and that type of thing, or whether you have the endurance package. I happen to have stumbled onto a pretty good endurance package, and because I know that, I'm gonna try and feed that part of my life and milk this for as long as I can to be able to maybe get something really out of the next 10 years of my life. Um, so the other thing I'd recommend to you folks is, is um, to start studying. There's a lot going on now about recovery science. Uh, it isn't enough just to get out there and to really you know, get a good workout. We need to know how long we should wait after workouts and whether stuff like this works. Do energy drinks work? Do do special drinks after you uh, exercise work? Does compression sleeve garments work? How about foam rollers, saunas? This woman is fantastic, this, this Christy Ashwinden. That book is only a couple years old. And uh, I think it's worthwhile to look at that. And the biggest one is the last one. It's sleep. It's, it's mind-blowing how sleep is far more important than any of these other, you know, what I call, you know, could be even gimmicks, uh, recovery uh, trends or, or hot topics. And it's a myth that we need less sleep as we're aging. We need the same amount of sleep. We need to get a good eight hours in. And if you're not able to do that, then this book helps you, or you should start thinking about what am I doing to, uh, what can I do to, to get more quality and better sleep? Uh, I'm a big fan of the Fitbit. I like to keep track of how active I am. Um, you can also use it as a sleep monitor. Um, I have a few people, no more than five or six, that I like to exchange information with, not for competitive purposes, but just for reinforcement and support that, hey, yeah, you get out there. You set a goal this week and you, and you, and you met it. I'm a big fan of this, this app. Uh, it's, it's an app that swimmers, runners, backpackers and bicyclists use, and it's, it's only used for activity. I like this app because you gotta do something to use it. You gotta swim, walk, hike, or bike to use it. So what's, well, this is a good app to do. You know, it, it, it's not gonna do anything for you to tap anything on it you know, all day long, so it's very satisfying to have a map of what you just did, have kind of like some data, save the data, and just help yourself at working towards your, your goals of keeping on moving. Um, yeah, and let me say the last thing here about goals. Um, this also is, I, I, at the top you can see the bicycle, uh, the shoe is highlighted. So my, my goals right now are to try and hike a thousand miles a year and bike a thousand miles a year. And I'm checking this like every week and making adjustments. And I, if, once you set that goal, and once you have routines established, there's a good chance that you know, you'll be able to do this. So I find, I find some of these things on the phone actually useful. This is one of them. And I wanna end by just showing us an example of, um, of what can happen here. So um, this is Grandma Gatewood. And Grandma Gatewood was the um, first woman to hike the Appalachian Trail and she hiked the Appalachian Trail when she was 67 years old, and she had birthed 13 children, and she was abused every day in her life by her bastard of a husband, and she knew she wanted to hike that trail because she read about it in National Geographic when she was younger. And the minute her youngest daughter turned 18, she, she, she didn't tell her husband, she didn't, let, she didn't tell any of her kids, she just left, 
and one month later sent them a postcard that she was up on the trail, and she was the world's first um, ultralight hiker. She never had a tent, never had a sleeping bag, wore kids, uh, didn't have a backpack. It, it was astounding. She never cooked. Uh, it, it, God bless her, but, but she did it, and, and she ended her life on such a wonderful note, and she, after hiking it three times, she was, I think, in her late 70s, she said, hey, it's the anniversary of the uh, uh, Oregon Trail. She walked the whole Oregon Trail when she was almost 80 years old. So if I can inspire you to keep going by anything that I said here today, um, I feel like been successful. And, and thanks very much. Um, I, I just want to also end by saying that I do have a book for sale on the table. I don't want, it, it's a, my first book, it's about my last Continental Divide Trail through hike. And I'll hang around there if anybody wants it signed or anything, they can do that. But I'd rather not go home with any books. All right, thank you very much, Alex. This is awesome.